Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're talking evolution. But before we get to that, a few housekeeping details. First of all, we have some new Patreon supporters to thank very much. Woohoo! First, welcome back to Alex Katz. Yay! And thank you and welcome to Je Yor and Anne Miller. Hooray! <laughs> Thanks, Anne. Anne's my aunt. <laughs> so thank you very much for your support. And to all of our ongoing Patreon supporters, we really, really appreciate your interest in our work and your financial help. Thanks very much, everyone. Second, though the first session has just finished, Mark, do you want to talk a little bit about your speakeasy stuff? Yeah, I did a four-week seminar about etymology, and it's called The History of English, Learning to Think Like an Etymologist. And in it, so it's four one-hour sessions for four weeks, and in each session I talk about a different aspect of you know, how etymology works, how to understand etymological information when you read it in a, a dictionary, and how to kind of evaluate that information when you get it. And it's run through Speakeasy, which is a company that helps speakers who are, you know, anything from academics to people who have interesting careers or interesting histories to do a, a sort of seminar series. Um, online. Online. Yeah, all of this is online. Online through Zoom. And so I, I did this, this course and it was great. And, you know, we had a lot of fun. And if you are interested in this, I will probably be doing a, another session of this particular course or perhaps a different topic sometime soon. So keep tuned to the podcast, but also we'll post things on social media and on the community tab for the videos if there's more coming up. But we'll definitely make sure the word gets out for the next session or two. Uh, I don't think there'll be anything probably before May yeah. May or June. Want to get into in, into the sort of summer a little bit before we finish off the term, finish off our school term. So, I, you know, finish off all the grading that I have to do uh, and then we'll we'll look at doing another session. Right. So just keep an eye out for that and do check out speakeasy.fm if you're interested in other courses, too, because there are um, a whole bunch of interesting and quite eclectic courses available. Yeah. Lots of good stuff there. They're small and personal, like yours, you had 10 people in your group. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a, an interesting way to get some sort of personal and interactive. So, you know, it was very much hands-on. Yeah. I, I set little exercises for, for people to do, and I was available for questions of all sorts. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. So next up is our cocktail. And this episode, we have something a little bit special. Because we were completely stumped as to what to do for a cocktail. So I put out a call on Twitter joking about, so can anyone find us a cocktail for semantic shift or codex cocktail? And Ed Bedford, Ed Betty, E-D-B-E-D-I on Twitter, came up with a codex cocktail for us almost immediately, actually. Mm -hmm. So this is dark rum, cold black tea, honey, lemon juice, and soda. And I'm going to read Ed's description of it. The dark rum with its oaky vanilla-ish flavors is a nod to the woody origin of the codex. Similarly, the honey gives a hint of the hinged wax tablets that might have led to the design of the codex. Then the tea gives a sense of muskiness, almost like old vellum. I can't get the lemon to work thematically, but a cocktail needs balance. The layered soda gives a hint of the different leaves of a codex. This could be accentuated by carefully pouring the soda over the back of a spoon so it leaves the rest of the drink as a distinct layer. I'm going to say that I was very proud of myself that I actually managed to do that. Yeah. I don't know if it'll show in the picture when I put it up on the website, but you can go look. So that's his idea for a Codex cocktail. Cheers. Cheers. Mm, it's tasty. It's very good. Mm -hmm. Be a nice summer drink too. Yeah. With the soda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I think we need to make this a thing. So everyone <laughs> spread this, this around. This drink. Yep. This drink around. Tell people about it. Make it yourselves. 50 mil of dark rum, 25 mil of cold black tea, 25 mil of honey, 25 mil of lemon juice, and 100 mil of soda. 
stir everything except the soda and then pour the soda over. And I'll, and I'll put that on the, on the show notes too. And Ed happens to have a newsletter about drinks and about the ancient world. It's called Liber Adest. Which just sounds so, so awesome. perfect. I know. So it's it's just a fun newsletter. I'll put a link in the show notes. You can search Liber Adest, L-I-B-E-R space A-D-E-S-T and find his newsletter. And thank you very much, Ed, for coming to our, <laughs> our aid. Yeah. It's a great perfect. cocktail. It's perfect. I'm totally drinking this again. So there we go. The Codex cocktail. Mm-hmm. I think this may also be a thing in that I may start turning to Twitter more when I'm stumped. Yeah. Oh, and speaking of cocktails, in response to another listener's suggestion, I am working on a page for the website collecting up all of the cocktail recipes we have made for all of our podcast episodes. So all the podcast episodes that we had a cocktail for, I'm putting pictures of and links to the recipes and which episodes we used them in. So hopefully, maybe by the time this goes up or sometime soon after... I will have a page on the website at alliterative.net that has all of our cocktails collected there. So if you've ever heard an episode or have a vague memory of an episode where we had something that sounded yummy, hopefully you'll be able to get that soon. Okay, I think that's everything. So what are we talking about today, Mark? Well, the video was originally made as part of a group collaboration to mark the anniversary or the, I guess the birthday of Charles Darwin. And so it was a bunch of videos about evolution. And so in the original video, I talked only about the etymology of the word evolution, but I talked about the evolution of the senses of words. So I'll be talking about semantic shift, and then it will also move on to other matters, including the evolution of book technology. All right, so we'll listen to that, and then we'll come back and talk a little more about those details and some other stuff about language shift, really, and language change. Why do words evolve? It's well known that language changes over time, but why and how do the meanings of words change? Is there any pattern or system? Basically, meanings adapt to suit the needs of the users of a language, with some disappearing when they are not useful, and others spreading quickly because they fit into new environments. The question of why is particularly complicated, but generally there can be said to be a variety of psychological and sociocultural reasons for this kind of change, such as the need for taboo replacement and euphemism, like how to pass away gain the figurative sense of to die instead of referring to any literal movement. As well, real-world changes can trigger semantic change. So for instance, technological change, which can render an old word obsolete, or can require the existence of a new word for a new technology while sometimes old words are repurposed for new concepts. Think, for instance, of the word dial, which comes ultimately from Latin dies meaning day, and therefore originally referred to a sundial or other similar clock face. When other physically similar devices came along, like compasses, they too could refer to dials, and later still, when rotary knobs and controls such as on a rotary phone came along, they too became dials. Now, when we push buttons or touch numbers on a smartphone, we still call it dialing, even though there's nothing rotary about it, and certainly nothing to do with the length of a day. Similarly, in the days of movable type printing, the word font referred to a complete set of letters in the same typeface, so called because they were all cast together out of metal. Think foundry. Now, with computer word processing, font refers to the typeface itself. Sometimes changes can seem random, but there are some systematic patterns we can see in how words change their meaning. The first axis of change we can see is narrowing versus widening. Examples of narrowing, also called specialization, include meat, which in Old English was a general word for food before it sense narrowed to specifically the flesh of animals. Deer, which originally meant any wild animal before becoming restricted to the specific species we mean today. Starve, which in Old English meant to die, but now means more narrowly to die by lack of food. And girl, which could originally refer to a child of any gender. The opposite process, widening or generalization, broadens or extends the sense of a word, as in bird, which, as Old English brid, meant specifically young bird, with the word fugel, fowl in modern English, being the more general word for bird. And whereas bird widened its meaning to refer to any bird, fowl narrowed its meaning to refer specifically to barnyard birds such as chickens, ducks, and geese. 
A similar example is holiday, which originally meant a holy day, before its meaning extended to any time off. And a special case of widening is genericization, in which a trademark name becomes a general term for the category, such as Kleenex in some dialects, or as I covered in a previous video, linoleum. The next axis of change is pejoration and amelioration, whether a word becomes more negative or more positive in sense. So for instance cunning originally meant learned, coming from the Old English verb kunan meaning to know. The negative sense of skillfully deceitful doesn't crop up until much later. An interesting case are the words silly and nice. Silly originally meant blessed or happy, coming from an old Germanic root meaning luck or happiness, but the sense went through a series of changes from blessed to pious to innocent or harmless to pitiable to feeble to feeble in mind or, as we think of it today, foolish. Nice on the other hand, coming ultimately from Latin nescire, to not know or be ignorant, went therefore from meaning ignorant through such senses as foolish, shy, fastidious, dainty or delicate, refined, and ultimately pleasant, agreeable or kind thus going from a distinctly negative sense to a distinctly positive one. So be careful who you call nice or silly. Similar to this type of semantic shift is the degeneration or elevation axis. The Old English words kaffe and knicht both meant boy, but the former was demoted to become knave and the latter was elevated to become knight. Weakening and strengthening of semantic meaning is another axis found, though weakening is by far the more common. Something that's awesome, fantastic, and fabulous isn't usually characterized by literal awe, fantasy, or fable, and something that's terrible or horrible doesn't usually invoke actual terror or horror. You can sort of think of them as hyperbole or exaggeration that becomes banal. One example of the opposite might be kill, which seems to have originally meant to strike or hit, but later was strengthened to mean put to death. Two other semantic shifts worth mentioning are figurative ones, metaphor and metonymy. In metaphor, something, usually concrete, gains a more abstract, figurative meaning. Thus, the older sense of field is an open grassy area, but the word gained a metaphorical meaning when used in the sense of, say, the field of linguistics. And the base sense of grasp is to physically hold something with your hand, but you can now also grasp the concept of semantic shift. And while broadcast originally meant to scatter seeds, now we can say that this lesson on semantic shift is being broadcast on YouTube. Metonymy, on the other hand, is a semantic shift that happens when two things are closely associated with each other. So for instance bead originally meant prayer, coming from a root that also gives us the word bid, but because of the practice of the rosary or prayer beads, the sense transferred over from the prayers themselves to the little decorative balls on a string or chain that were used to count the prayers. An interesting case of metonymy can be seen with the words cheek and jaw. Cheek in Old English meant jaw or jawbone, and is probably related to the verb chew, but by metonymy it shifted its meaning to the closely associated fleshy part above the jaw. The word jaw, on the other hand, probably comes from the French word joue, meaning cheek, so originally jaw meant cheek and cheek meant jaw. So that's how the meanings of words evolve, and funnily enough, the word evolution itself is a good example of this. You see, Charles Darwin didn't coin the word. It's been around since Classical Latin and has had many different meanings in English over the years. Darwin wasn't even the first to use it to refer to the process of biological change through natural selection, which he famously expounded on in his Origin of Species. As it turns out, Darwin preferred the term descent with modification, and used the word evolution only once in his writings. It was Darwin's pal, geologist Charles Lyell, who was the first to apply the word evolution to this concept, and, as I said, the word had already been around for a while, making this an example of repurposing an older word for a new idea. In fact, this wasn't even the first biological use of the word. It had previously been used to refer to the idea of the development to maturity of an individual organism over its life cycle, and before that to all manner of developing processes, including, in the 17th century, to the semantic development of a word. This arose from the metaphorical extension of the Latin word evolutio, which meant unrolling, initially with the literal sense of the unrolling of a scroll, but more commonly with the metaphorical sense of reading through a book, which at the time would have been written as a scroll. Aside from clay tablets, scrolls were one of the first types of book technology for extended writing, not just brief inscriptions. Not that they would have called them scrolls at that time. For instance, the Latin for scroll is volumen, which comes from the Latin verb volvera, meaning to turn around a roll, which makes sense when you think about a scroll. 
Through the process of broadening, the term volume now refers to any type of book, not just scrolls. The word scroll is not so straightforward. Though it sounds like roll, it's actually not etymologically related, though its modern form with the L sound on the end probably does come from roll. Scroll comes from French escroc, from which we also get the legal term escrow, because it was a legal document originally written on a scroll. The French word, which comes from a root that means to cut, and also gives us shred and shear, originally meant a cut piece or strip, and then through that process of narrowing I mentioned, a strip of parchment, and finally a rolled up strip of parchment. The next big advance in book technology is what was called in Latin the codex, what we would think of as a book with pages bound together. The word codex, plural codices, comes from caudex, meaning tree trunk, by the process of metonymy because the codex technology evolved from wooden writing tablets which had wax covering them that you'd scratch the writing into. Several such tablets could be hinged together, thus leading to the form of the codex or book. The Germanic-derived word book has a similar tree origin, as it's related to the word beech, as in beech tree, so Germanic books were also originally wooden tablets. The ancient Greek word for book, by the way, was biblion, from which we get the words bibliography and the Bible, literally the books. Of course, the word biblion originally referred to scrolls, not the codex, as that came about later in Roman times. Biblion is a toponym, that is, a word that comes from a place name, in this case the ancient Phoenician city of Byblos, which exported papyrus. Which raises the point that ancient scrolls and early codices weren't made from paper. Papyrus is made from layering strips of the pith of the stem of the papyrus plant, a kind of sedge or reed. Our modern word paper comes from papyrus, even though it's made from pulp from plants like linen and hemp and later wood pulp. Paper technology was invented in China and was only imported into medieval Europe in the 11th century. But there was another writing material commonly used in medieval Europe, the skin of animals such as sheep or calves, known as parchment or vellum. The word parchment is also a toponym from the ancient city of Pergamon, where the technology was developed as an alternative to papyrus. The word vellum, on the other hand, is related to veal, the meat of a calf or young cow, from a Proto-Indo-European root meaning year, thus the idea of a year-old calf. Getting back to the Romans, they had another word for book in the general sense of a volume or scroll, Latin liber, from which we get the word library. Latin liber could also mean bark and comes from a Proto-Indo-European root which means to peel or break off, which also gives us, through the Germanic branch, the word leaf. Speaking of leaves, we still sometimes use the word leaves to refer to pages in a book, and there's another leafy word, folio, which has a place in this story of the history of book technology. A folio, from Latin folium, meaning literally leaf, but often meaning page, is what you get if you take the skin of one sheep and trim off all the curvy bits to make a codex. If you fold it in half and bind it together with others, you get what's called a folio-sized book, very large, a size that today we might associate with a large atlas. If you fold that sheepskin in half twice, you get a smaller book with four pages per sheepskin, which is called a quarto, what we would now think of as a large dictionary-sized book. Fold again and you'd produce an octavo, which is the size of a modern hardcover book. Fold again and you get an even smaller book, the size of a modern paperback. One more fold and you get something the size of a small notepad or smartphone. And these comparisons are no coincidence. When books started to be made out of paper rather than parchment, they tended to keep the same sizes as had been created by the properties of the sheepskin, because that's what everyone was used to. And even today, ebooks are designed to be about the same size as the books were used to. So essentially, your Kindle is the size of a sheep. Only now it's come full circle with e-readers that we can scroll through. Another old word repurposed for new technology in the ever-evolving history of the book and language itself adapting to new circumstances. So first of all, I have a couple of corrections to make about some of this information. A friend of mine, a fellow medievalist, has informed me that uh, a couple of elements in the video are in fact myths about the history of the book. Dun dun dun! <laughs> Though seemingly quite widespread ones, ones that have been passed on by other medievalists. So it's not just the popular media that seems to pass this on, but other, you know, people in the field. We'll come back to this idea of incorrect assumptions about the ancient world propagated by scholars. Mm. It's something I have to say later. So first of all, parchment wasn't invented in Pergamon, though the name 
the, the place name may still be the etymology, but that's just because Pergamon produced a lot of parchment, but they didn't invent it. Right. So for instance, the earliest known Egyptian use of parchment is from the 20th dynasty. So that's like 1195 to 1085 BCE. So a ways before. A ways back. <laughs> the widely reported story goes that parchment was developed in Pergamon when Ptolemy refused to export Egyptian papyrus to Pergamon. So they had to come up with a, a substitute. Right. But again, that's a story. Yeah. Kind of propaganda thing. Who knows? But. But they were, they did become a center for production. But they did be become a center for production. Yeah. So. So this belief seems to have developed from the fact that Pergamon was a major producer of parchment. So most of the etymological sources that I checked repeat this myth, though occasionally with, with kind of hedging language, mm -hmm. like was said to have originated or supposedly. Right. The other point is that there seems to be no evidence of the folding method to produce book sizes early, earlier than paper books. So yes, the folding method was used for paper books, but... There, which is why there is a, a mathematical relation yeah. between the different sizes. Okay. And, and which is why old books, you have to sort of cut the pages. Right. After the, the book was bound and you bought it from the store, they could still be all joined up or, you know, some of the pages mm -hmm. double joined up and you still, you have to yourself cut them up. So it was used for paper books, but there's no evidence that it was used before paper. And it kind of doesn't make sense when you think about it because parchment is very stiff and would be very difficult to fold like that. Right. I mean, you could maybe fold it once, but folding it that many times, I don't think stiff would- Stiff and thick. And thick, yeah. yeah. So the source for the idea that book sizes are, are connected to sheep sizes, I got that from a post on the blog Got Medieval, which is written by a medievalist who works with manuscript images. So seemingly a reliable source. And is in general a reliable a really, source. Yeah. Like this is not yeah. a, an overall statement. Yeah. But it's been widely reported in other places such as Wired and Nidorama and all these, you know, get, right. the story got picked up. But if anyone has any in, any more information about this, I'd love to hear it. Okay. Now, also a few sort of expansions or clarifications, not corrections, but just sort of a little more info about some of the things that I had said, though the distinction is often made between parchment coming from sheep and vellum from cows, I should point out that that distinction doesn't always hold. Terminology is not so clear cut. It's not it's so clear cut. Yeah. So sometimes it is used that way, but not consistently. The, the terms are sometimes used interchangeably for right. animal skin writing surfaces. Right. Okay. As for the word folio, when we talk about foliation in medieval manuscripts, it's customary not to number the pages as we do with modern books, but to number the leaves. So rather than numbering each side of the page, you number each leaf, each separate piece of paper or whatever. And then you refer to the front and back of each leaf as recto and verso, respectively. So right literally meaning the, the right side and the turned side. Right. Okay. Uh, the pages in medieval manuscripts were not originally numbered at all. So this convention is a modern scholarly convenience. And this is an important point as we'll see in a minute. But if you look at online scans of manuscripts, you'll see that at some point someone wrote gone the numbers in. in. Yeah, yeah. Those are not originally there. That is a right. later scholar, probably in the 19th century, who wrote the numbers in. So, you know, they were defacing a thousand year old manuscript. But on the other <laughs> hand, making it usable. Accessible. Yeah. 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 You know. So in that voiceover, though I implied the importance of technological development in book technology, it's worth taking the time here to discuss it more explicitly. The benefit of the scroll over the clay tablet is fairly obvious, as the thin rolled up papyrus can include far more text in the same amount of space, in other words, a higher information density. What's not so obvious though is the leap ahead that the move to the codex really gives you. And by the way, as a quick side note, it's frequently reported that Julius Caesar was responsible for the invention of the Codex 
though I haven't been able to verify this story, I have no idea even where it comes from, but it seems to get said. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and just say that's a myth. But is it it an ancient myth or is it a later? Oh, I don't think it's an ancient myth because we really have no mentions of codices in our literary sources Mm, for a very long time. I might be wrong on that, but that was the brief scanning that I was looking into the history of the book. We have material evidence that the codex comes in around the first or second century, but no mention of it until much later. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, maybe it was ancient in the sense that in the fourth century, they said Julius Caesar invented it, but not contemporary to Julius Caesar. Also, everything you're saying about the development of the book, I'm going to have things to say about afterwards. Just (laughs) warning you now. Well, if anyone knows where that story comes from, yeah, I didn't look that up. You could have asked me to (laughs) to research it ahead of time because I didn't look it up. But if anyone knows, let us know because I'm I'm curious. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. Now with a scroll, the text is available in a purely linear order. You literally have to scroll through the text, making it difficult to go back to a previous passage in the text but the codex allows for random access. And it's perhaps not too much of an overstatement to suggest that this plays an important role in the explosion of information that has accelerated technical scientific progress. So it's something of a feedback loop with technological progress accelerating the pace of progress of technological progress, if you will. Because you have information organized in a book form, you can do more progress. And therefore, because you can do more progress, you can. So anyways, that's (laughs) at least the standard understanding of this. But it's funny that in a way we've taken a step backwards to some extent, at least with e-readers, e-books, which are somewhat more clumsy at flipping through the text. And so once again, we're scrolling through a book rather than having physically multiple pages accessible immediately. And with the switch to paper, that's much cheaper than parchment and the whole printing process, obviously, which caused an explosion in the 15th century, its own information explosion with more books being printed in the first 50 years than had been produced in the 1000 years before the printing press. So again, book technology can have far reaching consequences. Absolutely. Now, the one thing I will say for e-readers, though, that you couldn't do before is you can search. Mm -hmm. So that is, although you're still stuck with scrolling, you can search an e-book in a way that you can't. And there's hypertext. Hypertext. That's also possible. You can do a quick to a Wikipedia entry or depending how your e-text is Mm -hmm. set up, you can be looking up dictionary words. There's a lot of. So there are are compensatory functions in e-readers that make up for that limitation, I suppose. But back to the codex, the other big advantage is that it allows for an index since page divisions give us distinct reference points. Though they didn't have those until until much later. The numbers in, yes. (laughs) So they didn't take advantage of that particular... Not right away, but I mean, page numbering was invented before the modern era, you know, in the early modern period they did. They just went a thousand years without it. Yes. (laughs) Yes, they went a while before they did, but it made it possible. You couldn't do that with a scroll. Well, unless you, unless you numbered every column. Well, I suppose you could number columns or something like that. I mean, there there are divisions within a scroll. There's no actual reason you couldn't number the columns and then have an index that said which column it was in. True. But they didn't. I am 100% behind you that an index is a wonderful thing, however. Yes. I am a big fan of indices. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, that page numbering, I mean, it didn't really take off until the early 16th century. So indexes come towards the end of the 16th century. So that's obviously a long time after the invention of the codex. Now, during the 16th century, we find the invention of the bibliography with Conrad Gesner's Bibliotheca Universalis, a bibliographic index of all the books Gesner could get his hands on which at that time was, you know, just sort of possible for an individual. A to very w- rich and well-connected person could sort of do it. Sort just like, of do it, yeah. Just like the Library of Alexandria could sort of collect all the books yeah. in the world, sort of. So that's why we have, you know, that that term, a Renaissance man, so to speak, right? The Renaissance man was literally the last man who could do that. Though he really couldn't. It was he only couldn't. In, Even then it was really beyond. Well, and was also only... European and only yes. within a certain subset yeah. of languages, you know, he wasn't collecting all the Chinese scrolls no. in the world, was he? No, that's true. 
The Mayan texts. The word index, by the way, as you might have guessed, is the same word as the index finger and comes from the Latin verb indicare to point out. This makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. So an index is pointing out something in, in a book. And in Latin, the word index could refer not only to the finger, but also to anything that points something out. So like a sign or a token or a person who betrays a secret. In other words, an informer. And appropriately to our discussion, it was also the word for the title of a book. Right. Yeah. Again, it points out, yeah. to, points out the subject contents, matter, yeah. the contents. In any case, all the 16th century pagination and indexing points out another problem with the modern ebook. As I said, there's no consistent pagination as the screen and font sizes are potentially variable. Are you reading it on a phone? Are you reading it on a tablet? And what font size you're using? And so any kind of page numbering you get in an electronic context is going to change. I mean, that's again, a completely solvable problem. There are ways you, you to make, get around. See, it's interesting. Classical texts mm -hmm. that we have in the modern world, we have editions, right? For poetry is different, but for prose, every time it's printed, it's going to have different page numbers. Yeah. How do you refer to it? Same problem. So what they do is it's usually the very first printed edition of that text had whatever page numbers and whatever columns and whatever paragraphs. And that becomes the set references, yeah. right? So, so now you have an edition of Plato and it's numbered in the margin according to the page numbers of the first early modern edition. Yeah. yeah. And while that is truly mind-blowingly confusing if yeah. you're a student who doesn't know this because it's a different system for every text because it you know was printed by a different person at a different time. But nonetheless, that principle could be used. One can, can be used. when when you first format a book for mm -hmm. ebooks, you set a page number, and then you just have a little page number that comes up and you you doesn't matter how many pages you're on page four, you're yeah. still on page four. It's, it's a completely messy, doable thing. It's messy but doable. Yeah, but we can all we can all live with it. Like we can manage that if we want it to. Mm -hmm. It's not a you know it's not really a technological limitation. It's just a convention mm -hmm. limitation. In any case, we can certainly make the case that like the development of the codex, paper, the printing press, the index, the move to electronic text has allowed for a similar explosion in information and innovation in our modern world because. Everything is searchable mm. and you can have hypertext and all of those things. And it's also available in ways that, you know, yes. you aren't limited by physical Mass availability. Mass production is so easy when it's just electronic. And geographic barriers become much less. Yeah. So let me, since you've set me up so beautifully, <laughs> let me... Tear down everything that I just said. <laughs> let me problematize and complicate this narrative. Actually, first I want to just turn to something which you didn't talk about, but I just... I, think an interesting addendum to the history of books, because what you didn't talk about in perfectly fine reasons was reading, which, you know, it goes books along with readers. books. Yeah. Books have readers. And speaking of myths, there's a particularly persistent myth about the evolution of reading from the ancient to the modern world, which I read a very interesting article about. And it's the idea of silent reading. So the story goes that in the ancient world, Greek and Roman worlds, everybody read out loud to themselves or, you know, to others, certainly. And it absolutely was true that reading could be performative and very often people read things to other people. But that even when you, if you were alone, no matter what the circumstances, you would sound things out as you spoke. And the story goes that this was in part just a convention, but in part because the way the manuscripts are written, which was in scripta continua, which is where you write all the words come close together. There's no spaces, there's no punctuation. So all the letters just go to the end of the line and then start the next line. It makes it very difficult to parse which words are which, and you need to sound it out in order to be able to read it. So this was the story. This has been the story and the story of the book, you know, people who work on book history and indeed among classicists to some degree. And there's one particular story that is always pulled out. So there's a couple of instances where people remark upon, with some surprise, somebody who's found to be reading silently to themselves, reading without speaking. The particularly famous example is Augustine talking about his yeah. teacher, Ambrose. That's the one that I know as a medievalist. It's yeah. a very famous. Very, very famous. And that they came upon him reading silently to himself and then they went away and were surprised. What a weirdo. Then there's another, there's a couple of other ones, one famous one about Caesar and some other, some other ones as well. 
However, in the article, Silent Reading in Antiquity and the Future History of the Book by R.W. McCutcheon from 2015, the argument about this is summarized, and this is not the first person who has put forward this argument. It's been put forward by classicists from somewhere near the beginning of the 20th century and picked up in the 60s and later, but hasn't really made it out into book history very much, that this is a pile of horse feathers. <laughs> essentially. Now, not that the ancient world did not read aloud. Absolutely, people did read aloud. But that it was the complete default and that, you know, the ancient world was not capable of reading to themselves and only the few lone geniuses were able to do so and everybody who saw it was completely shocked and appalled, that there's really no evidence for that. So this article talks at some length about the Ambrose passage and goes into further details and sort of says, no, this is actually all about the relationship between Augustine and Ambrose, and that it really was not about surprise that he was reading silently, but surprise that he continued to read silently even when other people came into the room and did not share what he was reading with them. Wow. Okay. So that they sat there watching him read in silence and then went away and that that lack of sociability of reading was surprising, but that the, it was not surprised that he was able to read silently or even chose to do so. Anyway, the point that McCutcheon really makes is mostly that, yes, there are a few episodes where people seem to note the reading silently, but there are also about the same number of episodes where people note somebody reading aloud. That is, nobody talks about it very much at all. There are actually only a, f a handful of descriptions of either case. And everybody says that these four, you know, the fact that there are so few references to reading silently means that it was very rare, but not that the fact there's only six references to people reading aloud in private, you understand. McCutcheon is not disputing the idea that people often read to other people, that it was often very performative. Not disputing that, but the idea that in private you would read aloud to yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, there's basically an equivalent number of mm -hmm. citations that you could make for that. But this story has come up that those are that's the default and the silent reading is exceptional. So could we assume from that that both practices were yes, that's probably pretty common? That's McCutcheon's argument, is that you know, it may well be that reading aloud was more common than not, but then silent reading was by no means vastly unusual or restricted to a few people. And they make the point that for the Roman world in particular, and they really were talking mostly about the Roman world, there was in fact quite a long period of time in the second and first century BC where scripta continua wasn't used. There was mm -hmm. punctuation. There was punctuation between every word. Mm -hmm. There was a punctum between every word. And scripta continua came back into fashion in the early empire which is about the same time as Codices started and when we have Ambrose reading to himself and stuff. And there's also quite a lot of evidence for a very visual approach to text. For instance, we were talking about this quite recently, you and I, acrostics. Right. Roman poetry is very fond of acrostics. Acrostics are only a visual thing. And we have a fair number of contexts in which emphasis on the physical aspects of papyrus scrolls is very clear in a way that the text is interacting with the physical thing it was on in a way that would only make sense if you're reading the text and looking at the physical thing. So if somebody else is reading to you, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense. And a visual appreciation of text, not aural appreciation. I know in the Middle Ages, they sometimes used a pointer to read. So mm -hmm. you would point to the words as you read to yourself, right, right. whether you're reading out loud or to yourself. Did they have that I don't, practice? I don't know. The example I know of that is specifically the Alfred Jewel, yeah, yeah, which, which is, is the, the, the fancy pointer. head on the end of the pointer. But it's also mentioned in the text that, that these things exist. Yeah. And so we believe that the Alfred Jewel was described as a very ornately decorated jeweled pointer yeah. that was supposed to stay with the book yeah. and never be separated. Yeah. So I don't, I just don't know about it. So basically, McCutcheon argues that there's an over-reliance on and a cherry-picking of evidence for the rarity of silent reading, and specifically that this has to do with the particular narrative of the development of the book. So I'm going to read a fairly long quotation because it is so on point for what we, we uh -huh. just discussed. It. So basically, McCutcheon says, like, if there isn't that much evidence for it, and classicists have been saying for about 60 years that it's really like this is made up, why do book historians continue to, to say it. Why is it argued so strongly? I suggest it fits within a much larger narrative that scholars have constructed concerning the dual evolution of the book and human thought. In scholarship in the history of the book over the longue durée, four seminal events typically define the stages of development of this artifact. These events are, one, the invention of alphabetic writing. Two, 
the shift from scroll to codex, and the supposed rise of silent reading in Christian monastic culture. Three, the invention of the printing press and the increased dissemination of uniform information and the enlargement of public knowledge. And four, the ongoing shift to digital media in our own age with the possibility of larger and more complex storage within a hypertextual environment. We might say that alphabetic writing was the first sea creature to crawl onto shore and breathe air, while the scroll was the hirsute knuckle-dragging prelude to the more hygienic print codex, with the digital text becoming the final culmination of these physical developments and advancements, the apotheosis of the book into a non-corporeal yet omnipresent form. McCutcheon then goes on to say, to torture my metaphor even further, <laughs> I, I, I'm being intentionally, you know, over hyperbolic with this metaphor because I want to make this point. The point that McCutcheon is making is that this becomes a teleological narrative of technological improvement, that everything is progressing towards an end point of, of better technology, but also better cognitive development, leading to things like this idea of evolution as progress, that evolution is always progress forward, as opposed to what evolution in the biological sense actually is, yeah. which is random change. Yeah. <laughs> random change, which then develops into fit, but you know, the change happens randomly. The, the and change there is no always end. drives towards the perfect fit in a particular environment, but those environments obviously change and there are other environments to become fit to. So, yeah, so you can change no in a peak. random way and then find a new yeah. environment to fit into. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there's even no in, in our discussion there. of page numbers, right. for instance, if the codex was needed so we could produce the index, why did it take a thousand years? Because, well, because the codex wasn't produced in order to get the index. You know, this is not, it's just, these are just... So I'm not I'm not trying to argue that everything you said is incorrect, but McCutcheon does go on to talk about like this idea that the scroll is manifestly less innovative, allows for less innovation than the codex, really does not take into account how the scroll was or was not actually used, that scrolling in a digital medium does not necessarily make it less possible. And I I mean, I spent a lot of time reading what people say about how codex, you know, the codex is necessary for cross-referencing and, and thinking to myself, have you read an Augustan poet? They clearly spend all their time looking at 700 different texts and then finding ways to like cross-reference it throughout their works in this minute way. And they did all of that without a codex. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it may make it easier, you know, not again, arguing that that's not true at all, but an over-reliance on this narrative of progress, which then allows people to, or causes people to simplify actual historical evidence is really what McCutcheon is arguing. And so I thought that was an interesting sidelight and also, you know, corrective, not, not to undercut everything you were saying by any means, but to suggest, and McCutcheon does go on to say at the end to talk about like, this is important for us thinking about the future of the book and not thinking of, as you say, we're going back to scrolling, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a regression because that suggests that evolution is only progress. This is another type of evolution. This is another change. There are many elements of scroll culture that could make that we could think about. And, and if we pay more attention to how, for instance, the Romans actually interacted with their texts, as opposed to the way we want to fit them into the narrative, then we can better think about how people are interacting with digital texts now as using that as a comparanda rather than fitting it onto our little evolutionary chart of, you know, figures progressing through time. Right. Yeah. And I think those are some good points. And, you know, as I said, there are often trade-offs with these things, mm -hmm. right? You get some advantages with moving to electronic text and some disadvantages. Mm -hmm. So it's not a straight line sloping mm -hmm. upwards. There, There's all kinds of trade-offs that you're making with different technologies. They have their strengths and their weakness. And yes, you know, particular cognitive strategies may work better with one form than another, but we are very flexible cognitions, <laughs> you know, like we are, we are very good at finding the right way to work in the particular context that we're working. And it doesn't make it impossible for us. The script to continue a thing, for instance, there are lots of scripts in this world that are continuous and don't have spaces. And those people in those cultures can read silently perfectly well. Mm -hmm. It may be easier to do so with more punctuation, but doesn't mean we can't do it. No, and I would say in terms of the sort of cognitive implications of these things, it's much more nuanced. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I think is undeniable is the information density. Yes. So scrolls are not information dense compared to codexes. 
and codexes are not information dense compared to electronic files. One other sort of related thing that I just want to bring up because it's too often elided in the history of the book is the other part about reading is in the Roman world, who was doing the reading. And when we talk about people reading in the ancient world, the other really important part is that a lot of the time, it was not the person who was doing the reading who did the reading. <laughs> that is, in the elite Roman world, and if you were an upper class person who read a lot, odds are most of the time you were being read to. It was an enslaved person who was reading to you. And when you wrote, much of the time you probably also were not writing, you were dictating to an enslaved person who was writing it down. So does that suggest that there is less silent reading then? Yes, perhaps. But this is part of also the entertainment. So entertainment was people reading to you. But yeah, a lot of that reading was, that doesn't mean that they weren't capable. Again, the argument here is not that nobody ever read out loud. The argument is that reading silently was not an exceptional skill and totally impossible and hardly ever happened. But that a lot of the reading that was done, one of the reasons is there were no eyeglasses in the ancient world. If you couldn't read very well physically. There's a quite famous article about Rome before spectacles, punning on the spectacles of the entertainments. Right. But the idea being that, in fact, you can think of enslaved people as prosthesis in some ways. It's a, There are many interesting questions that rise when you do, but that's one of the reasons. And we know that, that when you were tired or when it was dark or your eyes were strained or as you got older and you couldn't read very well, you would have an enslaved person do it. So it's simply to know that elector or electrix, both male and female enslaved people, were very commonly used. They also used them for, as I say, dictating. Nobody suggests that Roman elite men were not able to write by themselves just because they often dictated to their secretaries in the same way that just because they often were read to doesn't mean they couldn't read silently to themselves, mm -hmm. right? They may have done it more often as another practice. There's lots of stories about people traveling and having slaves run alongside reading to them and one on one side reading to them, the other on the other side taking notes. Pliny the Elder was apparently always accompanied by at least two enslaved people who were reading to him and taking notes so that he could get through all of the volumes he wanted to read in, in all of his time, like when he was walking or taking a litter somewhere or traveling or he just always had people who had to run along these people you know that became that was their job then and they were particularly good at it they had fine voices that they trained but they also weren't capital r reading in the sense that very often you get the sense from our authors that they did not think that those people who were doing the physical reading were gaining the substance of what was being read. But is that just... Oh, of course. No, no. I, of course, it's the it's the enslaved, it's the slaveholder's view, not the... Right. But, but my point being that while they were the physical transmitters, they were not the audience, mm -hmm. right? So you have to think about the way they are always policing who is the actual reader of the text as opposed to the reader of the text. I'm making hand gestures here. That's very bad for podcasting. And the authors we have very rarely refer to this. They'll say, I read, I read this many books and I read this much and I wrote this much. And then every so often they'll say, I had it copied or I had it written or I had it read. But the grammar does not take note of these enslaved people, which is very normal in Roman stuff. They ignore them all the time. So it's up to us to unpick and to find those details. But that also, you know, when you talk about the technology of the book, it is important in the same way that we have to think about scribes in the medieval period as being part of the technology of the book, not the authors, but the scribes in the same way the enslaved people in Rome, the readers are part of the technology of the book too. So does this suggest that literacy rates were actually quite high? I mean, yes and no. They were more, maybe, maybe literacy was more widespread than you might think it was. That is it cut across class lines in ways you might not expect. Because we do know that there were many women, at least at a certain mm -hmm. status and above, yeah. who were, who learned to read and write because yeah. they would do. We've got Oh yeah, no, the, uh, the, the, upper, the upper classes were, I think, very literate, mm -hmm. both men and women, but they were also a tiny, tiny proportion of the people that right. existed in the room. You know, they really were the 1%. There were many enslaved people who were literate, but there were many, many more who were not. It was a specialty job they were trained for. So if you weren't being trained for that job, you weren't, wouldn't necessarily be literate. But I think in a wealthy person's household, I would say that, yes, probably many of the slaves were literate to some degree, for sure, because that would be part of their function and their tasks. But again, we have to remember how small a portion of the population that always is. Right. So 
But yeah, literacy at Rome, I think, was higher than in many other comparable pre-modern states. Not all, but then some anyway, mm -hmm. because it was a more useful skill for various reasons. Anyway, the article that I was reading about that, about enslaved readers that was really interesting, was a chapter called In Ancient Rome by Joseph Howley in a book called Further Reading, which is in 2020. Joseph Howley is, is someone I know on Twitter. And so I thank him for helping me with some of this material. All right. So tell us more about words and how they change. Well, first, I want to talk about one particular word and how it changes, <laughs> and that is the word evolution. So I kind of summarized quite briefly the semantic development of that word, but taking a closer look at it is actually quite interesting. So it's first recorded or the first recorded sense of the word evolution in English is actually in reference to a military maneuver. And that is in the early 17th century. Hmm. So rolling out troops, if you want to think of it that way. Right. Then we have some literal uses of the word to refer to various types of turning movements in dancing and gymnastics and even machine parts. From the 17th century, we also see the word used in more figurative senses, such as the sense of a progression of a series of events, like the unfolding or unrolling of history. Right. From the 17th century, we also see the word used in a variety of mathematical senses, such as the opening out of a curve and the extraction of a root from a given power. Skipping forward after the word had come to its modern biological Darwinian sense, it comes also to be used in other scientific contexts from the 19th century, such as the development of the earth or the universe. So the mm -hmm. evolution of the earth, the evolution of the universe in sort of geographical or physical senses. But as I mentioned, Darwin mostly avoided using the term himself in part, perhaps because of the notion of a simple unfolding or revelation of history, which might have invoked a, a more creationist notion mm -hmm. of natural history, which he was trying to Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that idea of the Seven. teleological yeah. progress, the sort of ongoing mm -hmm. linear progression, he was trying to explain it didn't yeah. work like that. Yeah. So he may have avoided it so as not to give the wrong implication here. And also because it had previously been used in reference to other theories of biological development, such as preformationism, in which organisms were thought to develop from miniature versions of themselves. Mm -hmm. Now, as I mentioned in a previous video on Charles Darwin's grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, which we did as podcast episode, Mm. <laughs> I can't remember now. I didn't look it up. I forgot. But that senior Darwin also used the word evolution in reference to his own proto-evolutionary theories. So Charles himself used other terms such as transmutation and descent with modification. And the only time he used the word, he only used it once in all of his writing and specifically in its verb form to evolve in the final sentence of origin of the species <laughs> from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. Good sentence. Yeah. But that's the only time he used the word. Right. <laughs> so turning now to semantic shift more generally. So, you know, generally what we see in semantic shift is a move from sort of more concrete to more abstract senses. So for instance, the word peace comes from an earlier sense of communal living. And, and now I'm talking like really big time. So long time, deep time. So the word peace comes from Anglo-French pace, from old French pace, which means peace, reconciliation, silence, permission, from Latin pax, compact, agreement, treaty of peace, tranquility, absence of war, which is related to the verb pangora to join, and pagus, community, which goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root pag, which means to fasten, like literally to fasten, mm -hmm. on the notion, the figurative notion of a united group, a bound group, or a binding together perhaps through some sort of treaty or, or agreement or something like that. And the word pact is from that same root as well. Right. So we have this very concrete sense, which develops this big abstract sense. Right. Now, one of the semantic changes that I mentioned was weakening, but it's very frequently talked about as semantic bleaching. So I should have mentioned that that is 
quite a common term for it now. You'll often okay. hear people referring to semantic bleaching. That's the same thing. Right. Weakening of a sense. Right. It, it okay. loses its semantic force. An another thing that I should have mentioned that I forgot to, there's another type of figurative change along with metaphor and... Metonymy. Metonymy. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's the one I did mention. The one that I didn't mention was synecdoche, because there are a bunch of words that have senses that develop through that path. So that's when a part stands in for the whole. So when a captain calls for all hands on deck, you shouldn't be imagining, you know, like disembodied hands, disembodied the, the hands thing? crawl. Yeah, yeah. It's not from, like thing uh, crawling on, onto. Yeah. From, deck uh, family, yeah. So no, it's not that what you should be imagining is the sailors themselves coming onto deck. Who so are called hands, hands because they use their hands. Their hands. <laughs> yeah. So the part standing in for the whole. Similar to this is when one uses the name of say a capital city, such as Washington to refer to the whole country or the, the whole government of that country. So when you talk about Washington, well, you don't really mean this whole city of Washington. You mean the government of the United States, which resides in Washington. Yeah or Hollywood, referring to the entire entertainment industry, yeah. right? So an interesting example of synecdoche in which a new meaning has sort of taken over as the primary meaning of a word is the word table. So in old French, table meant a board, but now refers to both in English and in French to the entire piece of furniture, including not only the top, the tabletop, the board part, mm -hmm. but also the legs. Right. And so in Latin, tabla, you know, that meant like a writing board or yeah, something like yeah. that, right? It's not a piece of furniture. It's uh, just a tablet, the, a board. Yeah. yeah. Another type of change or sense shift that is sort of interesting is called, oh God, I've never pronounced this out aloud before. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> oh, I'm excited now. An antiosomy. Very nice. I don't know if it's right, but, but you said it confidently. An We're going to go with it. <laughs> yeah. Must be that. Cause it's like polysemy and antiosomy. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so that's when two opposite meanings are found in one word. So a contronym or uh, a Janus word. So this is when you see a word that has two different meanings. Very often this is because there were two separate words which became homonyms. Right. Though not always. So the most famous example, I guess, is cleave, which can mean to cut apart or to you join know, join tightly. together, yeah. bind together. Those are from two different words, actually. Right. So one is Old English kleoven, which means to split, separate from the Proto-Indo-European root gleub, which <laughs> means to tear apart or cleave. And the other sense comes from Old English klevion or kleovion, to stick fast, to adhere. And that comes from the Proto-Indo-European root gloi, which means to stick. That's the same root that gives us glue and clay and... Right. Clue, interestingly. Yeah. Go watch the video on clue for more on that particular <laughs> word. Mm -hmm. Another example is let, as in to allow. So let me do it or to prevent, as in without let or hindrance. Right. That's an archaic meaning of it now. We yes. don't use that. I don't anymore. think we use that very much anymore. Again, that's two different words. So there's old English latan, to allow, to leave behind, to depart, to leave undone, bequeath, and so forth. And that comes from a Proto-Indo-European root led or lay, to let go, slacken. And the other sense comes from Old English letan, to hinder, delay, impede, which comes from the Proto-Indo-European root lay. Uh, well, also the same, it comes from the same root. Okay, that's interesting. I, I didn't notice that until just this moment. <laughs> They both come from the same Proto-Indo-European root, but, but they, they took very different took journeys. Different journeys. Yeah. And so there were two separate words in Old English that then fell together again. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. The other sort of good example of two senses that actually come from the same root is sanction. So a sanction can mean a positive decree that says, yes, you can do this, or it can mean a negative decree that means, no, you can't do it. So it means to permit, but also to penalize. Yeah. So I thought it would be interesting to look at a few more representative examples of some of the semantic changes that I'd mentioned, just because they're interesting and surprising and go through weird paths to get to where they are. So another example in the sort of widening, narrowing end of things mm -hmm. is the word meal, which we can 
so we can compare the word meal as in food, sitting of food in a day, right? Mm -hmm. Food that you eat at a specific time of day. Or we can see meal in the sense of a piecemeal. So bit by bit, one piece at a time, gradually. This comes from the Old English word mal, which meant a fixed time or occasion, which goes back to a Proto-Indo-European root, may to measure. So in other words, both of these, these senses come from this idea of to measure. So it's either a particular time of day, measured time of day, mm -hmm. or measuring one bit at a time. Right. Another word is season, which can mean time of year or adding flavor to food or aging wood. And so again, this comes from the sense of the time of year. We have Old French saison, meaning season, date, right, moment, appropriate time or sowing or planting. And ultimately it all goes back to the Proto-Indo-European root say to sow, to plant mm. seeds. So, mm. you know, it's the time for sowing and then it just became the widened to a particular time for anything, right. any particular thing. There is a season. A season uh, for, Turn, yeah. turn, turn. Turn, turn, turn. Yes. <laughs> and so uh, the sense of, you know, improving the flavor of something by adding spices, again, that from the idea of aging it long enough so that it's ripe. And therefore tasty. And therefore tasty. And seasoning wood comes from the idea of bringing it to the best state for use. So letting it again go and for a period of time. time and it takes time. Now for amelioration and pejoration, an interesting word is the word fond. We can compare it to, I talked about silly and nice. Silly and nice. Yeah. And so nice becomes ameliorated. So this is kind of similar in that sense. Fond originally meant in the 14th century, deranged, insane, and also foolish, silly, unwise. The, the idea is it's, it's probably a past participle, fond or fawned, right? So there's a verb that was fawn that meant something like to be foolish, to be simple. And so we don't know for sure where it comes from, but it's believed to be from Scandinavian, from a Scandinavian word. Word. Okay. The meaning evolved via sort of foolishly tender to having strong affection for. Mm -hmm. That sense of fond meaning not quite clever, not quite all there. Right. I mean, it's still there in Austin. It hangs it's around still, for a good while. It's there for a long time. Yeah. Interestingly, another sense of the original, that original verb fawn was to lose savor lose kind of flavor, mm. which has been speculated to be the original meaning of the word. So huh, okay. another one that's kind of similar to that is tidy, which comes from tide, like, you know, the ocean tide, but originally it meant time. And so in old English, right, teed okay. meant time. And so that obviously makes sense. The tide is, you know, the time of the ocean going in and out. Mm -hmm. So it too meant in season, in other words. So therefore opportune and excellent. Mm -hmm. And from that, it, it developed the sense of in good condition or healthy. So tidy has that sort of sense that, that, you know, kind of positive, specifically positive sense. The word smart can mean both intelligent, clever, and painful, right? That smarts. Yeah, right. And this is always the problem etymologists have to wrestle with. Are we dealing with two words or one? And if it's one, well, what's the connection between... How did, yeah, how did it develop these disparate mm -hmm. meanings? Mm -hmm. So the Old English word smart meant painful, severe, stinging, and it's related to a verb smerton, which, you know, has kind of a similar sense to hurt, basically. And so the, the meaning executed with force and vigor develops by around 1300. And from that you get, therefore, quick, active, and therefore clever. Right. So the original sense was cutting or piercing or something like that, something that causes pain, biting, and that can develop into the sense of sort of a cutting wit right. and therefore smart. Right. right. And to move smartly is still, I mean, it's a bit old fashioned, but you can still use it to mean quickly, mm -hmm. right? Like she bellowed at him and he turned around smartly or something like we, we do use that term. Though I think that's a little bit archaic now. Yeah, but it's, I don't think to the extent that somebody wouldn't understand it if they read it. Right. You know, I don't think, I don't think we've lost it. It's just kind of fixed now into moving quickly in very specific mm -hmm. contexts. Now, one example of pejoration that makes sense once you hear it is the word mean, which originally meant sort of common, shared by all, so in yeah. common, right? Mm -hmm. And so therefore, if something is common, it is sort of lowly, 
inferior because the hoi polloi has it. Is the sense of in common, is that where we get the mathematical sense? Mean, yeah. The mean, the, the middle? The mean, yeah. So it develops that technical sense as well. And then keeps it because once you have a technical sense, it yeah. tends to preserve a sense. And also the sense of stingy kind of comes from that. So, you know, if you're low-minded. One sees the snobbery of the, snobbery of, of it. Of the yeah. people who get to coin these words. Mm-hmm. And common has that, the word common oh, itself absolutely. has that same progression, right? As does vulgar. Vulgar. As and, do, yeah, yeah, all of these. A bunch of words. <laughs> yeah. Well, and as does, say, the Greek word idiotes, mm-hmm. right, from which we get idiot. In Greek, it meant just sort of a private individual. But from that, it develops the sense of a sort of ignorant person. And eventually, it was used as a term to refer to mental deficiencies, thanks to the 20th century American psychologist and eugenicist Henry Goddard. So yet again, here's another one of our works that mentions eugenicist because mm-hmm. they keep cropping up. And it's one of the reasons we should try to avoid that term, though I it's one of the ones, one of the many ones I'm not always good at yeah. leaving out of my vocabulary, especially when I'm angry. But it's, you know, it is an ableist term that should be avoided. Mm-hmm. And I have been working on it. As a little bit of a teaser of a video to come. Someday. Finish? I'm fairly <laughs> certain you've teased it the last three podcasts. Yeah, well. But anyway. <laughs> Both the words native and naive come from Latin nativas, which means literally born. And it comes through the old French naif, which means naive and natural, genuine, but also therefore just born and therefore foolish or innocent. So it's got this sort of unspoiled kind of aspect, right. but that can be, which can be positive or positive, negative. Yeah. It could be, you know, drawn out into this negative sense and naive in English anyways has that. Well, I guess it can be used it, it, in it art really terms. It really depends on the context and it yeah. depends on the context. Somebody could be an innocent, naive child and mm-hmm. isn't necessarily bad. Yeah. It really depends on the context. And again, you see the, the same sorts of things with the word villain, right? Which comes from Latin villa, which just means like a country house Mm -hmm. with a farm. And so a villain was originally just a farmhand, but because people look down on farmhands, it becomes, you know, this negative term. Yeah. Yeah. And then it becomes bad person. As opposed to say the words urbane and urban, Mm -hmm. right? So if you're from the city, if you're from the urban place, you are there for urbane. So sophisticated. Mm Mm-hmm. So, you know, we can see these very predictable, I suppose, or at least predictable in hindsight, sense progressions, these pejorations or ameliorations. Mm -hmm. And then finally, we come to, you know, the the sort of figurative senses like metaphor and synecdoche and metonymy and so forth. Right. So have you ever thought about the word nail? What would you guess is the original sense of that? The fingernail or a metal spike? I'm going to say the metal spike. It seems to be, though it's not at all clear, it seems to be that the fingernail sense is the older meaning, but both senses go way back. Right. So as a metaphor, this is a very old metaphor. Both senses were there already in Old English, though they use different spellings to try to and differentiate, differentiate them. them, but they clearly come from the same root, the same Proto-Indo-European hmm. root. So some of these metaphors can be quite quite old. How about the word litter? So we've got litter in the sense of, you know, scattered rubbish. Yeah. We've got litter in the sense of uh, a number of young brought forth by an animal. Right. In one birth, that is to say. We've got the sense of like a stretcher or... Something you carried on. Carry, something that you're carried on. And then we've got litter as in the sense of straw or hay or something like that used for the bedding of animals. Or what I think is probably closely related to that is like kitty litter also, yeah, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. So stuff kind of as a, as a bedding for, for well, animals. Well, I mean, the discarded trash, the animals and the bedding for animals all seem like they'd come from the same thing. Probably bedding from animals and then that is the stuff. It's either the stuff strewn, which becomes bedding for animals, which is also where animals have their babies, therefore it's a litter, or animal stuff to strewn trash. Either way, I'm not sure which way it would go, but surely those are all connected. So any guess as to where it might come from? Think Latin. Yeah, I mean, I feel like it could come from the stretcher first, because then it would be lectus. Lectus. Yeah. Yeah. So lectus meaning 
you know, bed or whatever, mm -hmm. a thing that you carry around. So beds were originally just sort of mattresses stuffed with straw or something similar, right. which could be stored away, you know, in when you weren't using them. When you weren't using them. And so the portable idea is there. And therefore also the straw for bedding and therefore bedding for animals. And because animals are born on that bedding mm -hmm. and a disorderly accumulation of straw and hay and so forth, then, you know, it's yeah, not very far to go from there to, to trash. Yeah. What about stock? Which spelling? S-T-O-C-K. Not A-L-K. No. I mean, it doesn't it just mean a stick, basically, originally, and then it comes to mean like 85,000 things. 85,000 things. Yeah. So it seems that the, the sense of a trunk or a stem or mm -hmm. a stick or something like that is the original Food sense. Stock and branch, yeah. And then metaphorically, that extends to the idea of a line of descent. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he comes Family from, kind of stuff, from yeah. good stock or whatever. And from there you get anything that's made of wood. So there's a whole bunch of senses made of wood that come from that tree sense. Right. So like a stock as in an artificial support structure, but you also get the financial stock because that was originally a wooden tally representing a sum of money lent to the king. Okay. And hence we get the financial sense of stock. Stock as in equipment and so forth might have developed from the idea of a branch growing on a trunk. And then from that you get like soup stock or paper stock, which are similar in the fact that their base is some raw material or supply or something. So in the case of a soup stock, bones and vegetables, in the case of paper stock, mm -hmm. rags and pulp. And then you have other senses like a hollow receptacle or, you know, the object of contemptuous treatment, like the laughing stock. Does that come from the stocks? Probably comes from the stocks, again, made of wood, mm -hmm. right? And you get the sense of the heavy part of a tool and therefore part of a rifle. So the stock of a rifle, again, made of wood. And so you get all these senses that develop out that way. Right. A couple of other interesting figurative senses. Staff. How are those connected? Staff as in like a stick, mm -hmm. a rod or whatever, and staff as in a bunch of employees. Well, a staff that you lean on, I would have thought would be the original. And then the staff who are your helpers in a store would be the people you lean on and rely on, like you rely on a staff. And it specifically comes through a military sense. So a staff okay. was originally a military company or whatever. So the body of officers were your staff. Right. And probably is connected to the idea of a staff of authority. So they follow the staff. Oh, okay. Okay. So they're not what you rely on. Not, not, that. not what you rely on, but they follow the, the staff of authority. And similarly, band, right, which can mean a sort of banner, mm -hmm. like a ribbon right? okay. kind of thing. And that comes to therefore refer to a military unit, a band of men, because they all follow the same banner. Oh, okay. So those are some other interesting examples. And the last thing that I want to kind of round off with is obviously people have wanted to develop laws for semantic change because you, you know, mean laws to describe them to describe them yes not, <laughs> not to against them, them though against probably them. there are a bunch of people who would like to do that too <laughs> mm -hmm. so sound changes are so nicely predictable i mean there right. are obviously little lots of little complications but, but basically you can develop you can make, laws yeah, yeah. right but semantic shifts it's more difficult we can categorize so we've got all these different but you can't categories, predict but it's much harder to predict Mm -hmm. or, um, or go backwards, right? Mm -hmm. Like to, to say from this, it must have gone through this process to get here. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what you can do with sound changes. So it's, it's less regular in terms of its directionality than sound changes are. But, you know, some of the basic things we can say, and this is kind of drawn from a book called Word Origins by Anatoly Lieberman. Cognates are words that have the same root. After developing from the protoform, that root, cognate words go their separate ways, and in each language their sounds may change. These sound changes are regular. However, numerous factors disrupt the regularity of sound correspondences, such as onomatopoeia, sound symbolism, the adoption of baby talk, blending, taboo, the effects of humor, hybrid forms, borrowing, and so forth. Similar words need not be reflexes or continuations, in other words, uh, mm -hmm. of a protoform. So just because you have two words that sound the same doesn't, doesn't mean, mean they, come, they from come from the same, from the same place. place. If a sound correspondence exists, related words should be assembled on the phonetic principle, but 
a sound correspondence is only a compass and we must look for words that have a semantic bond with the words we are investigating. And of course, the important point to make there is, you know, that's a very loose term, a semantic bond, right? Yeah. So they can be... sort of sound the same and they can, you can see, how, but how close a sense do they have to have before you think you've got genuine cognates? Right. Yeah. So that's a tricky step. That's a tricky jump to make there. And of course, similar words may be synonyms, but sometimes we need to uncover the semantic relationship. So sometimes it's obvious, but sometimes we have to dig a little to find why stock and stock are related or whatever, right? Right. And so the meanings of words can drift so far apart that the unity of the word as one word rather than two separate words that can be lost. And so, you know, sometimes we think of them as two separate words, mm -hmm. even though they do come from ultimately the same source. Conversely, different words with vaguely similar meanings can merge and begin to look like they always were the same word. So that's kind of how etymologists have to think about semantic shifts and how you unravel all of these things. But when reconstructing the root meaning of like a proto language or something like that, you want to look for, and this is adapted from the book, The Horse, The Wheel and Language by David W. Anthony. You look for the most ancient meanings that can be found. So it's better to work from Latin and Old English than it is to work from right. Italian and Modern English. Because there are so many changes that can happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You look for the meaning found in all the language branches. So you want to look for the one meaning that all of the supposed cognates have in common, mm -hmm. not one that just exists in one of them. Mm -hmm. And you want to look for sort of corroborating roots of the root itself. So is the root derived from an earlier root? Right. And that can make it. And the other thing also in addition to that is you also want to look for the meaning of a root that fits within a sort of semantic field of other roots with closely related reconstructed meanings. So if you can put together a little semantic field, then that, again, helps. that lends yeah. some credence to your reconstructed proto meanings. But always you have to think about which is more important when doing etymology. Is it the sound correspondences or the meaning? Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's neither. <laughs> so, yeah. So that's a word to the wise for those of you out there contemplating, are these two words related or not? You know, maybe, but maybe not. That was very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why etymologists like rarely agree on anything. Yeah. But also when they do agree, don't try to argue with them yeah. if they agree, because if they've actually managed to come to a consensus... If it's you've got, probably if pretty you've likely. got a bunch of etymologists <laughs> sort of all agreeing on the same Point, connection, yeah. it's probably true because they are likely to have different ideas <laughs> if it's not really solid evidence. Yeah. Well, I think that has rolled out to the end of what we wanted to talk about tonight. Mm -hmm. So we will finish up here and we'll be back probably with an interview next. We've got lots of people we want to talk to about lots of interesting things. In the meantime, stay safe, be well, and let's make it to the summer together. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out our website, www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits, and all our contact info. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at Alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on your favorite podcast app or to the feed on the website. And if you've enjoyed it, consider leaving us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye. <laughs>